Great. Uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to speak here. Um, so I want to start just by uh, saying a little bit of notation. So P, of course, is going to be a prime. Uh, and K is going to be a finite extension of that p-adic field Kp. And uh, like in Jeremy's talk yesterday, this is going to be a talk about uh, local Galois representations, the Galois representation, representations of the Galois groups of p-adic fields. So GK is going to denote the absolute Galois group of this p-adic field K that we've fixed. So the uh, starting point for this talk is the following uh, remarkable theorem uh, by uh, of Matt Emerton and Toby G's, which I think really um, deserves to be better known uh, than it is outside the kind of uh, piatic language community. And the, the theorem is as, as follows. So for each uh, D, at least one, so D is going to be a dimension here of our representations, there, um, there exists a finite type uh, algebraic stack uh, right, xd uh, bar over fp uh, with the following properties. So before I go before I go any further, I do want to say um, for those of you who might be recoiling at um, the use of the word stack here, uh, for the purposes of this talk, you really don't need to know anything about stacks. Uh, all you need to know is that when I say finite type algebraic stack, then the words algebraic and if you want also finite type are really making this thing an object of algebraic geometry. So while it's not a variety, um, you won't go wrong uh, for the purposes of this talk in sort of imagining it. You can treat it well. So for example, uh, this thing has points, it has A points over uh, for any FB algebra A, and you can speak about its irreducible components and so forth. So somehow for all intents and purposes, um, for this, this talk, you can kind of imagine that it's some kind of generalization of the variety. Uh, I do also want to mention, so you see I put a bar on top of the XD, uh, and so uh, you might imagine that um, there's also a p-adic version of this, of this theorem. Um, but I'm just going to state the FP version. So what are the properties of this uh, XD? So uh, first of all, uh, for each a finite extension F of FP, I can tell you what the F points of XD uh, are. Namely, they're in bijection with um, the representations of row bar, row bar of uh, the Galois group of K into GLD of F. If I can make this line a little thinner. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, and when I say representations, so this Gala group is a um, topological group, so of course I, I need continuous representations. Okay, so the points of this stack over finite fields, characteristic P, are really the same thing as Galois representations uh, of, of dimension D. Uh, second, uh, this, this stack is equidimensional, meaning uh, all its irreducible components have the same dimension. And uh, that dimension is just the degree of A over QP times D choose two. And uh, Emmett and G also give uh, description of the irreducible components of this stack. Um, namely, what they are able to prove is that each component, and I'll, I'll write x of sigma for a component where sigma is some 
element of some indexing set that I'm going to suppress for the moment, but it's, it will come back eventually. So if I have a component X of sigma, it has a dense but open subset by U, maybe U of sigma. And uh, and its f points. So the, the property of, of this open subset U of sigma is that its f points are um, certain specified Galois representations. Um, in fact, they are all um, they're all extensions of characters. So I have a d-dimensional representation, and it's a successive extension of D one-dimensional representations. Okay. Um, but it, this is not a complete description of the points of um, the component, just the points of this uh, uh, open subset. So to give some example of um, how remarkable this theorem is, let me let me uh, mention one application of the theorem. Well, in fact, an application of the piadic version, but um, in any case, uh, Matt and Toby can prove uh, using this theorem that every row bar has in one, that is, every, every continuous rep representation of the uh, d dimensional representation of the Galois group of K uh, has a characteristic zero. And you might have guessed that this was known before, but as, as um, far as um, we can tell, it uh, has not known, in fact, previously known, um, are known for, uh, in dimension at most three. Okay. So what I want to discuss today which is joint work with um, Emmert and Ngi, as well as Anna Cariani, is maybe a more precise description of these irreducible components. Um, in the two-dimensional case. And our result requires P at least two. Okay. Now, uh, Alvaro, when uh, kind of briefing speakers for the conference, Alvaro uh, asked every speaker uh, to be sure to spend a, a bit of time um, speaking and in, in, um, um, doing something really elementary um, and uh, I'm afraid because of my introduction of the word stack early on, maybe I didn't do this at the beginning, but if um, if you've tuned out a little bit, then I want to invite you back in uh, because we're about to be uh, elementary again. I'm about to kind of do what I promised. Um, so uh, to begin describing the um, components of X2 bar, I want to uh, recall that for each row bar, for each two-dimensional mod P representation of the Galois group of this um, piadic field K, there's an associated set uh, which I'll uh, denote W of row bar. And um, this is a set of what? It's a set of irreducible FP bar representations of uh, a GL2 little k, which I meant to say earlier, k is the residue field. Okay. So this set W of row bar, there are various descriptions of it. And these various descriptions of this set are known to be equivalent um, 
uh, it will give the number of people. Um, but in particular, there is a completely explicit description of this set. Um, and I want to spell out this explicit description um, very carefully in the case where, um, where K is uh, UP, or just K is the p-adic field. Um, and alternate, there's a, just to say a little, I'll say a word or two about um, alternate descriptions of the W row, row bar. Again, if you think back to, to Jeremy's talk yesterday, Jeremy um, uh, reviewed a little bit of p Hodge theory and the theory of crystalline representations. And another description of this set W of row bar is given uh, in terms of um, the Hodge Tate weights of lifts of row bar to characteristic zero. But again, um, for what I'm about to say, uh, I'm, I'm really just going to spell this out completely, uh, concretely and explicitly uh, in the case where K is QP. So in the case where K is QP, the residue field little K is just FP. And so the elements of this set W row bar are irreducible mod P representations of GL2 FP. So let me just tell you exactly uh, what those are. So uh, they're... Um, parametrized by two indices, uh, S and T. And if you think about trying to write down some um, representations of, of GL2F, uh, GL2FP, well, one obvious representation, I mean, there may be two obvious representations of GL2FP, right? One, which is a one-dimensional representation of GL2FP, is the determinant character, right? So the map from a matrix to its determinant uh, is a one-dimensional a representation of this group. So another um, obvious representation of GL2FP is, uh, and again, we're looking at representations with FP bar coefficients, uh, is simply the two-dimensional F, right, the sort of standard uh, two-dimensional FP bar vector space where you just have GL2FP acting on it by matrix multiplication. Okay. And you have these two obvious representations. Now, what can you do with representations? Well, you can do various operations on them. So for instance, I could take um, the symmetric power, I could take symmetric powers of this um, two-dimensional representation. There's no point in taking symmetric powers of a one-dimensional representation. Of course, but I take its, say, tensor powers. And then I can take tensor of these things together and now I have a nice two-parameter family of representations. And in fact, these are exactly the irreducible FP bar representations of, of uh, GL2FP, except that uh, I needed to tell you the kind of values the parameters take, namely uh, S runs between 0 and P minus 1. So at 0, it's the, um, of course, the sim S. Sim 0 is the trivial representation. Sim P minus 1 is sim P minus 1. But when I go up to sim P, um, the p-symmetric power of the standard representation becomes reducible, so I no longer can get reducible representations from, from there on. And then t, well, the determinant is an element of fp cross, so the determinant, if I raise it to the p minus first power, again, I get, I get the trivial representation, and, and so in fact, with t, you can really just regard as, a, as an integer uh, mod p minus 1. Okay, so those are the irreducible fp bar representations of gf 2 fp so those are the elements of my set W of row bar. And so now I need to tell you how to associate a set of these representations to some two-dimensional representation of the Galois group of QP. Um, well, before I describe two-dimensional representations of the Galois group of QP, what, I need to say something about the one-dimensional representation. Maybe I shouldn't do that. I need to say something about the one-dimensional representation. So as... You know, if you've taken a course in algebraic number theory, there's a subgroup, uh, IP, a normal subgroup of the Galois group of QP called the inertia, the inertia subgroup. And the kind of complicated subgroup, um, but at least the quotient of GQP by the inertia 
group is relatively easy to understand. So um, what is the inertia subgroup? Well, it's really um, the subgroup that fixes the maximal unramified extension of QP. So this quotient is the Gala group of QP unramified over QP. And that is essentially by definition just the same as the Gala group of FP bar over FP. And um, what is this? Well, um, at least let me remind you that it contains, of course, the map sending x to x to the p. And this map, this Frobenius map, uh, actually generates a, a dense subgroup. So in particular, if I have a continuous representation of this right-hand group, it's determined completely by what it does to the, to the Frobenius map x to x to the p. Um, well, so we'll say uh, a representation of, of GQP is unramified if it's trivial. On this uh, inertia group IP. So if it's trivial on the inertia group, then it, it um, factors through this quotient and so is determined by its value in this Frobenius element. Okay. So then let me set pi to be some choice of p minus first root of minus p. And for the purposes of what I'm about to say, it doesn't really matter. You might be wondering why I put minus p here rather than p or something. It's really, um, well, it's not exactly just conventional, um, but um, uh, it, it, in any case, for what I'm about to say, it would work perfectly well to put any other um, unit times p uh, there. So let me let um, omega, this is going to be a function on GQP. And it's going to be a function to fp cross. And I'll tell you what it does to any element of this Galois group. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take g. And of course, g uh, acts on this element pi. And what does it do? Well, I've taken a p minus first root of um, something in qp. And so what can it do? It has to multiply it by a p minus first root of unity. So if I take g pi over pi, I get a p minus first root of unity, which I can really then sort of think of as sitting inside uh, fp, uh, well, fp cross, right? I can take a, a p minus first root of unity um, and reduce it mod p into fp cross. And so this map omega is a character of the group GQ, uh, gqp, right? You want to show that uh, omega of gh is omega of g times the omega of h. Um, and the point when you try to unravel what it means for this to be a character is simply that um, the Galois group uh, is acting trivially on the p minus first roots of unity. And that's true because those are contained in qp. Right? So this is a character, and it's a character of order p minus 1 because there's its image contained in p minus four first roots of unity. David? Yes. There is a question. Um, the question is, does an unramified representation correspond to something unramified geometrically? Uh, sure. Um, so uh, perhaps um, if, if you like, um, uh, well, let me kind of give you a kind of global answer to that um, rather than a local answer to that. Well, now I'll give you a local uh, answer. So um, now I'm going back and forth. So uh, say you take some um, variety over over Q, and say you look at its L adic Natal cohomology, um, and uh, you uh, so we're now L different from P, and uh, you um, so you take this representation of the Galois group of Q, this has QP as a subgroup. Um, and uh, so you can restrict this to a representation of, of QP. And um, uh, and so then uh, if your variety has um, good reduction at P and P is not the same as L, then the representation on the Italco homology is going to be unramified. 
Now, the thing is, I'm, a, I'm kind of in a, in a P equals L case where I'm looking at kind of mod P coefficients and a, a P at a Gala group. Um, and there, um, what unramified corresponds to is a little more subtle. Um, and how the, the good reduction is going to correspond to crystalline and unramified is going to correspond to a very special case of, of um, crystalline. But, um, but yeah, you can, so it certainly is a geometric mean. Okay. Uh, okay, so now let me go on. I've got this omega. Um, and uh, so because I've chosen minus D here rather than some uh, other uniformizer, uh, omega really is secretly is this the mod case of atomic character. Um, any case, um, now uh, you can do the following exercise, which is um, really kind of a straightforward local class field theory exercise now, which is that any mod p character of, of um, GQP has the form chi times some power of omega, where A, well again, the omega to the p minus 1 is trivial, so A I can think of as a an element of Z mod P minus one Z, and chi is unramified. Okay. And I'm gonna, for the rest of the talk, anytime I write chi, chi is always gonna be some unramified character. Okay, I'm not gonna kind of write that again uh, every time. Um, so to do this exercise, what you're gonna wanna do, of course, is use that, um, that the abelianization, so we're talking one-dimensional representation, so these are really representations of the abelianization of, of the Gallo group of QP, and use that this looks a lot. So here, I'm, this is not an isomorphism, but uh, it looks a lot like the units in, in QP. Um, in particular, any finite quotient of the group on the left is a finite quotient of the group on the right. Okay. So I've now described to you the one-dimensional representations, the one-dimensional mod P representations of the Gallo group of QP. Um, now another definition, let me set uh, pi 2 to be a p squared minus first root of minus p. And in fact, I won't write this down, but you should, I mean, there's a, of course, there's a choice of, of roots, um, and I, you should really make the choice compatible with my choice of pi. So if I take pi 2 and raise it to the p plus first root, uh, to the p plus first power, I get pi. Okay? And now I'm going to um, make a definition just like I did above, so let me let, me let uh, omega 2 be function. So again, this is the perfectly well-defined function on GQP. Uh, namely, I'm going to send G to G pi 2 over pi 2. And now, just as I kind of argued before, this is a p squared minus first root of unity. Well, f p squared cross you can identify with the group of uh, p squared minus first groups of unities. So I can think of this in my reduction mod p as an element of p f p squared cross. So as you see, I've written here, this is a perfectly good function on GQP, but it's not a character of GQP. The argument that I gave before um, doesn't quite work because you see that, um, I mean, this argument relied on the, the p minus first roots of unity being in QP and the p squared minus first roots of unity aren't. But they are in the unramified quadratic extension of QP. So that while this is not a character of GQP, it is a character of the Galois group of that unramified extension, which I'll denote Galois group GQP squared. And the inertia group is contained in the Galois group uh, of all of the unramified extensions of, of EP squared. So it, this is also a character of IP. And um, if I've chosen my pi 2 to be compatible with pi, then omega 2 is compatible with omega. So omega 2 to the p plus 1 is just omega. So having made these definitions, I can now tell you exactly what the two-dimensional FP bar representation. So we've got the so we've got some one-dimensional representations, and I can tell you now the two-dimensional representations. So one possibility, of course, is that it's uh, reducible. If I have a two-dimensional rep representation, it could be reducible. 
in which case it's an extension of two of the characters that I wrote down before. And then an alternative is that it's irreducible. And if it's irreducible, well, here's one way to make an irreducible two-dimensional FP bar uh, representation. I could take my omega-2, and maybe I could raise it to some power. And uh, this is a character of the Galois group of QP squared. That's a two-dimensional, that's a, uh, um, QP squared is a, a degree two extension of QP. So I can induce this representation from the Galois group of QP squared up to the Galois group of QP. Now I have a two-dimensional representation. And then of course, there's still the possibility of twisting it um, by unramified characters. Well, I can twist it by a character, but the kind of omega part, if I want to, I can absorb into the omega two part. It's just the unramified part sitting outside. Um, and so now B, because omega two has order P squared minus one, is an element of P squared minus one Z. Okay. Um, and it turns out then these are all the irreducible representations, uh, FP bar representations of the Galois group of QP. Uh, and let me just remark for future reference, if I take one of these irreducible row bars and I restrict it to the inertia group. So it's kind of convenient to describe these things um, by their restriction to inertia because then I don't have to write the unramified character again and again, right? Restricting to inertia gets rid of the unramified character. So row bar on inertia, what does that look like? Well, I have the character omega two to the B sitting in it. And then the, sort of the other character I get is exactly the Robinius twist of this. So it's going to be omega two to the to the p. Okay. So now I can give you an, a completely explicit definition of this set um, W of rho bar uh, as follows. So I've, I've listed the representations. I've listed I've listed the the sigmas. I've listed the rows, and so I can tell you exactly how to define this set. So first of all, let me tell you that, so I'm not going to take row bar and sort of tell you what tell you what the sigmas in it are for each sigma. I'm not going to do it quite this way. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you, first of all, that a sigma S0 is in W of row bar if and only if sigma ST is in W of row bar twisted by omega to the T. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you, uh, I'm going to give you conditions on, under which you put uh, each sigma of st in w of rho bar. And the first thing I'm going to do is sort of this first bullet point, um, which tells me I really only have to describe when sigma s0 is in w of rho bar. Okay. So now if rho bar is irreducible, then sigma of s0 is contained in w of rho bar, if and only if rho bar on inertia is omega 2 the S plus one plus omega two on well, the other right, is PS plus one. Okay, so that's exactly when sigma S zero is in W of row bar for irreducible row bar. And then combining these two bullet points, so here's a little exercise. Um, if you uh, want to just stop and, and play with this, um, you can show that this implies that um, sigma E minus one minus S S is also in W of row bar. So the point is you write down, you take sigma p minus one minus s comma zero, and you write down the representation that it has that as, a, as one of these uh, weights. Um, I, I think I haven't slipped into calling these serre weights yet, but, but the term one uses for these uh, sigmas is, is serre weights. Okay, so if you have the serre weight sigma p minus one minus s comma zero, that's some representation, and then the first bullet point um, tells you that if you twist that by omega to the s, you get sigma p minus one minus s s, and you'll see that it's exactly um, that it's exactly this this thing. Okay. Um, now, what about the reducible case? So, again, there's sort of a simple form, um, namely sigma s zero is in this set w over r if and only if rho bar on inertia looks like omega the s plus one star zero one. So it's an extension of the trivial character by this omega to the s plus one. And um, 
There's a little subtlety. This is almost right. Um, so there's an exception, namely uh, if if row bar looks like and now note I'm not writing on inertia. I'm talking about the whole re representation row bar. If this looks like an extension of some unramified chi by omega times chi, and let me note that in this case, this is sort of the case where so. How do I get omega equals, um, how do I get an omega there? Well, s plus one, omega to the s plus one should be omega. And in this case, there are two possibilities for s. It could be zero, but remember that upper limit for s was p minus one, and omega to the p is the same as omega. Okay? Um, so in this case, where there are two possibilities for s, then um, the group with extensions of chi by omega chi, this is a two-dimensional group of extensions. And inside here, there's a canonical line, which I'll call L. Which goes by the name the Perenifier line. And um, the exception is that if my extension is not in this canonical line, then um, well, sigma t minus one zero is in W of row bar. I want to get rid of the keyboard. Did you mean to say is not or is? You that one is. Okay. Let's see. Let's see if that. There we go. So that one in row bar, but not sigma zero zero. So if you're if you're not on this line in this case, you lose um, sigma zero zero. So just a kind of quick example of the numerology here. If I take omega to the s plus one, the direct sum omega to the s plus one plus one. So this this extension class is zero. It's trivial. Then of course this is the same. I can put the characters in the reverse order. And this is nothing other than omega to the s plus one tensor omega to the p minus two minus s zero zero one. I've just pulled the you know, omega to the s plus one out of the tensor product, and I'm using the fact that omega to the p minus one is trivial. And so you see that sigma p minus three minus s s plus one is in w of row bar as well. So before I go any further, let me um, tell you what this set has to do with arithmetic. Uh, so it's a theorem of many, many people. So in particular, the theorem about the state involves the fact that uh, it, it entails the fact that, that Sarah's conjecture uh, over Q is a theorem. So that's work of Carey and Dante Mergé and Kisson. And then it also includes um, the weight part of Sarah's conjecture um, for Q, which is um, uh, the work of many of uh, the other people I've listed here, and then also a certain reinterpretation of that due to, due to Ash Stevens. Um, and so the theorem said if I have some global representation, so some of the Galois group of Q, mod P representation of the Galois group of Q, two dimensional, so I have um, this two dimensional global mod P Galois representation, this is modular of some weight K and level prime to P, uh, if and only if. Um, when, so I, the theorem is going to detect. So I have some R bar by Sarah's conjecture. It is modular, and uh, I could ask what are the weights for which it is modular of some level prime to p? And the answer is that um, this is the case if and only if sim a minus two f p bar. So this, if k is big, this is a possibly, of course, reducible representation. So I can then take its Jordan Holder factors. I get a bunch of irreducible representations. And I can ask if any of those irreducible constituents are, um, are contained in the set W. Well, R is a global representation, so I can restrict it to the local representation, to the local representation at P. Uh, and then I can look at the associated set of Sarah weights and uh, 
If this is non empty, then this is precisely the linear modular of, of weight and level prime to be. All right. So in the last five minutes, what I want to do uh, now is finally state the theorem that um, I've been building towards and then draw you a couple of pictures. So, um, first of all, as I said, the theorem um, requires right now uh, P to be at least two. And the theorem says that the, the components of um, X2 bar are in bijection with stair weights. So, um, in fact, this labeling step that I suppressed earlier, the X of sigmas are in fact, the, the sigmas are just these stair weights, the irreducible representations of, um, this is a theorem, by the way, for um, over, so the, the theorem is fine if uh, K is an arbitrary extension of QP. Um, and so, of course, I've just given this description for QP. Um, so, um, okay. So the components of X2 bar are in bijection with stair weights. Um, and I need to kind of tell you what the, the property um, properties are that characterize this bijection. Um, so I... Um, one finds that uh, rho bar now lies on the component x of sigma if and only if sigma is in w of rho bar. It, there is an exception, so this statement is um, not quite um, uniform, and that's important. Now let me roll back up. Sorry, I forgot to introduce a bit of notation back up here. Um, doo -doo -doo. Yes, way, way back up here. So if S is P minus one, I'll call sigma S um, uh, zero. I'll, I'll call this Steinberg, okay? So let me now come back down. Okay, so let me describe the exception. The exception is that for sigma, the twist of Steinberg, so again, in the case K is QP, this is a twist of just sim P minus one, then rho bar um, is in either X of chi or X of chi enter Steinberg. Yes, chi tensor Steinberg is in W over O bar. Okay. Um, and let me just say that in um, in higher dimensions, one expects the um, precise relationship between um, uh, sigma being a stair weight, some irreducible, some stair weight being a stair weight for rho bar, and which components, um, which irreducible components um, rho bar lies on to become kind of much more complicated um, in general. Okay, well, let me draw you um, some pictures. So I should say, by the way, that um, given what I explained about um, uh, the relationship between this set W of rho bar and the modularity theorem, um, of course, this explicit description of, um, of the set W of rho bar when K is uh, QP is very, very closely related to um, uh, Sayre's original description of uh, Sayre's original recipe for a minimal weight of a um, modular form, uh, sort of predicted minimal weight for which uh, a given um, representation is modular. So the pictures I'm about to draw are kind of a geometrization of Sayre's recipe. So in this case, right, remember the dimension of um, this stack was. So again, I'm going to do this for K is QP. So the, the degree of K over QP is one, D22 is one. So these are one dimensional components. So, so here's X of 
sigma s0. And sigma s0, uh, we've noted, has kind of two special points on it. Um, one point over here is omega to the s plus 1 of plus 1, right? the, the um, reducible component, the, the not reducible, sorry, the split thing. And another point on here that's special is the irreducible point, so end omega 2 to the s plus 1. And then the other points are, um, are reducible non-split representations. But now we've kind of explained um, in each of these cases that the, um, to the, the irreducible case and the split case, so the irreducible case and the split case, um, that each of those representations has another weight. So in this case, we've seen that this also has um, sigma p minus 1 minus s s as a weight. You have the kind of component for that one meeting uh, this point. And then omega to the s plus 1 plus 1, um, this has sigma p minus 3 minus s, s plus 1 as a stair weight. And so I have another component attaching to it here. Um, so now I'm at, and I think, 41 minutes after I started. If you'll indulge me, I would like to draw one more picture and then stop. Um, so I'd like to draw the picture of this sort of exceptional case. Um, so let me draw two components, and this one will be uh, sigma uh, p minus 1, 0, and this one will be sigma 0, 0. And so what's going on? So uh, on sigma uh, 0, 0, um, the points are generically going to be extensions chi 1, omega 0, chi 2, with chi 1 not equal to chi 2. For sigma uh, e minus 1, 0, the points on here are going to be generically extensions chi omega star 0 chi with, um, with star not on this line L. And what happens at their intersection is that they're going to meet along along the extensions who, who lie in the line L. So what's going to happen is that along um, along this component, uh, I have these two characters that aren't the same, but uh, as they, they get closer and closer together, and finally I make these two characters become the same um, at this special point. And when they become the same, I get a representation in this canonical line. And then along this component, um, generically, I'm not in L, but then as I move across to this point, I become eventually kind of land in L. And so this is why these two components meet. So um, let me stop there.